in terms of the four speakers, uh, we're kicking off with John Barry. John is a professor of political economy at the Queen's University, Belfast. He writes a prodigious amount of uh, material about the nature of growth, politics, the pitfalls of growth, and as well as all this, he's a member of Greenhouse's advisory group. Um, the next speaker will be Anne Chapman, who studied science and uh, environmental issues at university, and then went on to research and publish research on the philosophy of science and technologies. And uh, she's one of the co-chairs of Greenhouse, and uh, she'll be speaking next. Um, the discussant afterwards will be John. Uh, uh, he's a freelance writer and a philosopher teacher. Uh, he's, he's got a long list of erudite uh, publications, which uh, if you want to sort of uh, go through all of them, uh, they're available uh, to, to read on the, the Greenhouse website. And he's also uh, one of the co-chairs of uh, the Greenhouse Think Tank. Um, our last speaker is uh, Reinhard Losker. He's now a professor of sustainability and social design at uh, Anus University in Germany. Uh, he was formerly a member of the Bundestag and uh, he's also um, a, a, a politician uh, in, in uh, the, the government uh, uh, in his city as well. And uh, as a sort of a fun fact, I think it, I would probably guess he probably knows more about amphibians than anybody else who's speaking today, but we'll find out maybe later. <laughs> Okay, if I can maybe hand over to John. And John, if you have any slides, uh, do feel free to uh, share screen. Great, thank you, uh, Prashant. I do have some slides. I'll hopefully be able to share them with you. Can you all see them? Yes, we can. Yes, we okay. can. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I mean, as uh, Prashant has introduced me, uh, I'm a professor here at Queen's University, but I'm also a recovering politician. I was uh, se seven years a Green Party councillor in that most unlikely of political environments of the post-conflict sectarian politics of Northern Ireland. So I'm speaking to you both as, a, as an academic, but also with a, an activist hat on. And like many of the other speakers, um, we've all produced papers on the greenhouse uh, gases section of the website. And I'm gonna be drawing some comparisons between responses to the pandemic causes and tackling our planetary emergency. Not somebody I'm, I'm used to quoting from, but this is probably a quote that's familiar to many of you. And I do think it's uh, underscoring the importance of crisis as a moment of opportunity for transition and transformation. And if you're interested, um, this is the paper that I'm speaking from that I produced for Greenhouse back in April. But you can find all the papers from the, the speakers today on that uh, website I've just put up there. So for me, I start by saying that the pandemic has cancelled the future, but that's okay because it was a shit one anyone, uh, that I do think the pandemic has paused uh, aspects of uh, ecocidal carbon fueled consumer capitalism, but I do underscore that it's paused. Um, and I do think this is an opportunity then to see how can we build back better, which is where I'm gonna finish off in terms of my contributions this morning. I think there are three lessons we can take from the pandemic and to see how it can help us uh, navigate and, and form some sense of agency around responding to the planetary crisis. One is looking at the causes of the pandemic, uh, how we're coping with it uh, in these extraordinary social distancing times, and how do we recover from the pandemic. So they're the three areas that I think we can see some lessons uh, from the pandemic to how can, we, how can we tackle and address the planetary crisis. But I do think we have to acknowledge there are significant differences between the pandemic and our planetary crisis. Um, it's not impacting, uh, that is, you know, climate breakdown is not impacting uh, those of us who are living in the minority affluent world in the way the pandemic uh, is. We're not seeing the immediacy of the harms and deaths and so on within our communities, particularly here in the overdeveloped minority world. And there is a dominant uh, discourse around, this is a temporary issue, a blip that we will return to normal uh, at some point. And therefore what we're facing in the pandemic is only a temporary risk. Uh, therefore all the changes we see in our lives are viewed in large part as temporary. That's what makes them bearable for many people and then of course we return back to normal. So therefore I think the dominant perspective, whether it's in the policy community or amongst our, our citizens, is that we have a warranted, uh, and I would think we do have a warranted uh, belief that we will solve the COVID-19 crisis and therefore there is a expectation of returning 
to normal. But I do think we have to acknowledge that there is nothing natural about either the pandemic or indeed the planetary crisis. This is a, a quote that uh, we're fond of using here in this part of the world in reference to the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s, that yes, maybe the, uh, the potato blight was natural, but it was the English and the colonial responses to the food shortage which actually caused the famine. Again, it's underscoring the importance of politics and the social dimension of what's often seen as natural events. Translating this in terms of the pandemic, this is my own version of it, that you could say global capitalism caused the, uh, the pandemic or the virus, but actually local national capitalisms and how different countries have responded, you could say, have caused the, uh, the pandemic as opposed to the virus. And we do see important differences nationally across different countries, how they've responded, you know, notably, you know, the way in which uh, in the UK um, is seen not to have had a good pandemic if such a thing is even possible. So some of the lessons I think uh, that we can take from responses to the uh, the pandemic for tackling the planetary crisis. We now see that despite 30 years of neoliberalism and running down the importance of the state, states can move quickly. Uh, finance can be found. Uh, sorry, Mrs. May, there is a magic money tree um, that we can see that governments can find the resources. And I would hear, I don't have time to go into it today, but I would encourage people to look up modern monetary theory uh, in terms of people talking about debt and austerity as the way to respond to this, I would absolutely resist that as the only way states can uh, do this. Austerity is a political choice, not a financial necessity. We can see populations can adapt and adapt quite quickly. That we can see innovation in terms of particularly sources of solidarity, whether it's on well, you know, WhatsApp groups of people reconnecting in the local area. We've seen a lot of outpouring, obviously, of support for our our key workers and so on. Um, we've also seen fear, uh, particularly in places that have guns like America, of people wanting to be released from lockdown. So it hasn't been a complete outpouring of solidarity, but on, on the whole, I think there has been positive lessons uh, in, in that respect. And we have seen some forms of effective communication, which I do think uh, can be read across to the planetary crisis. And this is this idea of flattening the curve that we've all become familiar with in terms of stretching out the, uh, um, the, the virus for as long as possible so that our healthcare systems are not over, overrun. And I think we can use a similar communication tool in terms of bending the curve down in terms of greenhouse gases. Uh, and that's something that I do think we can maybe pick up on in the discussion, because I do think it's a, it's a way of communicating a complex issue. Uh, so to take from what we're learning about flattening the curve to actually this idea of bending the curve down. Some other lessons are we can see that although unevenly, science can inform political responses. Please don't drink Dettol or detergent as that idiot in America <laughs> urged the citizens to do. But by and large, we have seen a science-led epidemiological uh, response. We've seen one some possible ideas are not only now possible, but absolutely necessary. It looks like Spain is going to make permanent some form of universal basic income, uh, for example. Obviously, there have been negative impacts, and we are looking at a quite significant uh, recession, depression, depending on one's view coming out of this. Uh, and there has been some uh, positive environmental impacts, whether it's you know fish returning to, to Venice, improvements in air quality in many major cities because of reduction in car traffic. Um, so to me, these do give us pause for thought in terms of, well, we've responded in these ways with states and citizens acting, uh, at least temporarily, does this give us some warranted hope that we can tackle the planetary emergency? And I think uh, it does, but I'm not naive about there's a simple, you know, read across here. And I do think we see in terms of building back better, there is a growing call among citizens, civil society groups, you know, uh, certainly some political parties that we can't go back to normal that we do need some sort of Green New Deal or a just transition as we come out of this crisis. And there's quite a bit of support. A piece I, I wrote for the conversation um, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. But we can also see this in terms of public support. Here's a, a Nipsos Mori poll from, from April in terms of people making the connection between, in some respects, the planetary crisis and, and the pandemic, but also seeing this as an opportunity to you know, move away from a carbon-based, particularly transportation system, 
uh, which seems to be one of the, uh, the issues certainly that people are, are learning in terms of improved air quality. You know, there are some benefits to what's happening to us now in terms of social distancing, working from home, uh, and some of these, I, I think, would give us pause for thought about what do we want to keep in our changed lives as we move forward and what do we want to absolutely not, not keep, which is something that I think we can discuss afterwards. But I do think that solving the ecological crisis is not the frame. You know, we may solve the pandemic, but I think we should be framing our responses to the planetary emergency in terms of our coping mechanisms, because it's going to be a much longer uh, period of dealing uh, with this particular issue. The pandemic may or may not be a one-off event. It could turn out to be it's like seasonal, seasonal flu. But I do think the issue is that we should find coping strategies and mechanisms. And I think particularly John Foster might pick up on this point in his contribution. So it's about enduring rather than simply coping, sorry, rather than solving the climate crisis. And I do think that in approaching the planetary emergency, we're talking about endless struggle. Uh, or it's going to be a, it's not going to be a quick event. It's going to be a constant engagement. Uh, it's going to be a long game as opposed to something that's been that's going to be over very very quickly. But you could say that the pandemic is like a warm up act, uh, or a way of us exercising perhaps atrophied institutions like the state, or perhaps dormant or suppressed social norms in terms of solidarity that we can use uh, as we go forward in tackling the planetary emergency. So there's no guarantee of success. I'm not naive in terms of how we address the planetary crisis, but we have to engage in, in, in the struggle. And the issue is that we, we, have, we have no uh, guarantee that we will solve the planetary crisis. I think we have to be upfront uh, about that. Obviously, I do think when you have children like I do, they're a promissory note on the future, and we do owe it to them to engage in this long struggle. So I do think that the pandemic has given us, as I say, some opportunity to exercise institutional and social and other norms that perhaps we're going to need as we go forward, but they are not going to be the same. The pandemic is going to be short term, whereas tackling the planetary crisis is going to be long term. There is no you know, solution, either technological, which I often think are forms of mythic wish fulfillment, that there's going to be an app to solve our planetary crisis, but we have to basically endure and I do think the pandemic has given us an opportunity, as I say, to dust off institutional, moral and social responses that we're going to need as we go forward in making the road. So here ended the secular sermon. Thank you very much, uh, John. That was an absolutely fantastic intro into the kind of issues that we're going to have to think about over the next uh, hour or so. Uh, I'm going to Go straight into uh, to introduce Anne now. Anne, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us Hi. about your thoughts. Uh, yes, I'm Anne Chapman. I've been involved in Greenhouse for a while now and I'm now co-chair and uh, I live in Lancaster and I too used to be a Green Party uh, councillor in Lancaster. Um, and I've done various academic stuff as well. So uh, my paper's called, um, I've heard I haven't got any slides, um, I thought I'd just talk and uh, so my paper is called Will COVID-19 Help Us Tackle Climate Change and you can read it on the Greenhouse um, the website if you go to publications and then gases. So uh, yeah so there's a lot of talk that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has been good for the climate because CO2 emissions have been down in a quite unprecedented way. Uh, so the contraction of economic activity, particularly transport, uh, has, has caused what uh, the International Ed Energy Agency think will be an 8% reduction in emissions uh, for this year on uh, the 2019 levels. Uh, and that sounds great, but actually, in the long view, this is insignificant if it's only temporary. We need to achieve that level of reduction every year uh, to actually uh, have a chance of uh, averting climate catastrophe. So perhaps more of more significance might be the uh, changes that this experience has, has brings about to how we think about things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be help us achieve more lasting change. And I'd like to talk about three possible changes, uh, one of two of which are, are probably good and one one bad, uh, I think. 
and, and then some similarities and differences. So first of all, I think the most important thing really that we've learned and that it might you know, help us to, to change how we think is that the virus has demonstrated that we are all one biological species. We're all part of nature. We're not disembodied minds. Everybody's susceptible. Uh, though, of course, in all countries, though, of course, there are variations in that susceptibility between uh, within the within the human population. So the older more susceptible than the young, men more than women, uh, perhaps some ethnic groups more than others. And I mean, overlying those biological differences, the differences in vulnerability because of posi our position in society, such as whether we have to go out and mix with people through our jobs or we can stay at home and, and work at home. Uh, and then there's uh, the, uh, the inequalities of um, the economic, economic impact of the lockdown measures. And there's been a lot of attention on these, on all these inequality, uh, the, you know, the, how people have, some people have been hit much worse than others. Uh, but I think it's important to hold on to that sense of ourselves as all one species, part of the ecosystem, because that's what we need to tackle climate change. So secondly, uh, and I think John Barry sort of, uh, uh, hinted at this to some extent. Um, it's, uh, it's been a challenge to our imagination. So way back in February, I remember a conversation we had in Greenhouse about, you know, how perhaps to tackle a climate emergency, we need to pause everything. And I said, well, that seems to be what's happening in China now with the lockdown. And I said, I can't imagine that happening here. So, you know, at that point, I could well, first of all, probably like lots of people in the UK, I saw the virus as something that was out there in China and not likely to really impact us here. And secondly, I couldn't conceive of everybody doing what they were doing in China and not going out and all that sort of stuff. But here we are several months into a lockdown, which hasn't been as severe, but it has been unprecedented and uh, had a, a high degree of public support. So um, this, uh, you know, climate change is a similar uh, challenge to our imaginations. I think in, in the sense of, um, I think it's difficult for us, even for those of us who, who uh, think about this a lot, to really imagine, you know, you know, we don't know, do we, what the impacts of climate change are going to be. And also what, what the measures are that we can and should take to to stop emissions and to um, at, or to adapt to a climate ch changing climate and I think at least the COVID crisis as John Barry has pointed out has uh, pointed out what might be possible if we really tried and governments really addressed it as an emergency situation so it, sh it should embolden us to ask for more uh, more far-reaching changes to uh, to our economy uh, and thirdly, I think this is a, a, a caution really that I'm getting increasingly concerned about, is uh, about how uh, the lockdown and the social distancing, it's been so effective. Is it going to, you know, are people going to sort of um, hang on to that fear of being with others? I don't think it's a fear of others, because there's been a lot of social solidarity and uh, you know, and perhaps that, that's a sign of hope that people can come together in a, in a crisis. You don't see, you know, well, we are seeing riots, but they're not about the pandemic. They're, they're about the racism. But, um, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, that, uh, how long will it be before people feel happy uh, meeting with others uh, for political activity, for example? Um, but also, the, you know, I'm concerned about the effect this, this is going to have on public transport, particularly outside urban areas. Uh, on my, every time I pass a bus on the cycle line, it seems to be empty. Um, so, you know, is our, is our public transport going to recover? And, and also, you know, what about people sharing and giving away things? Are we going to get really concerned about the possibility of viruses being on, on surfaces other people have, have touched? You know, there are these possible impacts that I think are, are quite negative. Um, and then, uh, 
next, we're going to talk about the, the, the three similarities, I think, between um, COVID-19 and uh, climate change. So one that John's mentioned is about the importance of scientific expertise and good communication of that. I think it wouldn't it be great if we could have a, uh, a press conference every month, say, I don't think we need one every day, about our progress to the transition towards the zero carbon economy and what we're doing and how we're achieving it and all that sort of stuff. And also the, the climate impact and, and what we think that they are. Um, and uh, secondly, I think there's a thing about the, uh, the even though you know, some people might be really scared about getting the virus and that, that had a big effect on them, I think for most people, they consider that, the, and this is true, that the, the risks of uh, transmitting or being infected with the virus from any one encounter is really low. But the problem is that those low risks all add up to a lot of cases when you've got 60 million people. So what population do can't be a national festival of choice because it's not really them they need to worry about. It's at a level of the, uh, the virus in the whole population, and particularly in the case when so many people don't have symptoms. So we have to be, um, we have to be told what to do. And I think it's the same with climate change. Our individual contributions are really small, and we can't leave it to voluntary action. We have, it has to be uh, sort of an enforced um, what you can and can't do. Perhaps it's very different sorts of rules, but we, we have to have, it has to be at the government level one country. And thirdly, uh, with COVID-19, timing has been shown to be critical. So countries that apparently overreacted early are going to come out of this much better than the ones like the UK, which sort of uh, thought about it a, a bit and um, you know, didn't really take, take action sooner. Um, so, um, yeah, and with climate change, the sooner we do reduce emissions, the better and the less impact in the long term. Unfortunately, though, as soon as we were 30 years ago, we have to acknowledge that. And we are already too late, but it's still important to do what we can. And this, the issue of timing brings me to the, uh, uh, the first of my two differences. And... Uh, the first is the time scale. Now, clearly, with COVID-19, days, weeks have mattered. And this has clearly been difficult for politicians to grasp. But on the upside, for, um, in terms of the rest of us, their actions, we're going to see what the results of those action, their actions are. And there's the possibility of holding them to account. Climate change, in contrast, plays out over decades. Uh, so the climate change we're experiencing now is a result of the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere several decades ago. And we don't yet know what the current uh, levels are, what they mean in terms of our climate. So political, act, political accountability is much more difficult and that's a real problem. Uh, and the second difference is I think that, and perhaps this is a benefit in a way, in terms of getting people to do things, that uh, individual behaviour change is not as critical. With COVID-19, there's no other way to stop the virus than um, us all changing where we go and who we see. I mean, there've been a load of system changes, if you like, to enable that to happen. But the critical thing that we want to change is what people do. Whereas with climate change, as the slogan goes, it requires system change. And uh, for example, there's a prominent sci climate scientist, Miles Allen, who's argued that focusing on individual action, such as calls for people not to fly or eat less meat, are really a distraction. And instead, we should require fossil fuel companies to ensure that there are net zero emissions from the production and combustion of their products. So for for every uh, you know amount of coal, oil, or gas they take out of the ground, they've got to take an equivalent amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And he says that's what we should be. That's how we should be addressing it. Of course, that will have implications for the cost of fossil fuels and lots of other knock-on impacts. So it needs political uh, leadership and public acceptability. 
but it's not the same as asking people not to go and visit their mum. So uh, yeah, it, it's uh, very different in that respect. And I'm just trying to find my notes. So yes, yeah, so to sum up, in conclusion, um, the um, we just marked about a month ago uh, BE Day, the end of the Second World War, and that changed many things. So good things like um, bringing the welfare state the NHS, but post-war years also saw the industrialization of farming, the expansion of industry, and in many ways the current ecological and climate crisis could be seen as originating in improvements to industrial processes and agriculture brought about in that era. And, uh, you know, taking that view, will COVID-19 and what with this current pandemic be seen as a similar rupture in our history? And will it be seen as the end of the fossil fuel era and the start of something better? Or, I think this is also a possibility, the end, the final end of international cooperation and a descent into authoritarianism driven by widespread economic insecurity and climate breakdown. Um, and what happens isn't inevitable and uh, the um, forces of nationali nationalistic populism are doing what they can to gain from this crisis and we need it in the green movement need to ensure that the lessons learned that lessons are learned and then they lead lead to a fairer economy uh, that stops trashing the planet so that's uh, I think I've taken probably more than my time sorry Thank you, Anne. That's a uh, really lot of food for thought there about this kind of bifurcation we have about how we respond to COVID. Um, can I make a suggestion now that if people want to ask questions, uh, do you mind just putting it in the chat box and then afterwards uh, I'll make sure that we can uh, sort of gather those questions together. I've got one or two so far, but it'd be good if we made use of that facility. Um, and if we've got enough questions, we can pursue uh, it on a basic, that basis. If there aren't enough questions, I think we might break up into chat groups. Okay. John Foster now, can you, uh, uh, I know you've uh, written a really interesting paper looking at um, the, the, the two other papers that Anne and uh, uh, the other John have presented and taking a slightly uh, different point of view. So let, let's, let's uh, hand over to you now, John. Uh, right, yes, uh, good morning everybody. I'm John Foster, uh, I'm a philosopher. Uh, I have no slides. As people will have noticed, I'm technologically challenged enough just to be here. Um, but uh, I do have one or two thoughts to, um, from, as befits a philosopher, a mildly sceptical perspective. So while I was thinking about what I was going to say this morning, my sister, Hi Sue, uh, sent me a link to a video of a little speech by the Green MP Caroline Lucas, um, where she's addressing the Green Party's theme of building back better after the pandemic and there she claims that in the light of our response to the pandemic now we know we know that quote goodness is hardwired in humanity uh, quote we can finally demolish the miserable mythology of human selfishness um, and humanity can act together to meet a common challenge now what uh, John Barry and Anne have just been saying is more measured uh, balanced and nuanced than that, but it isn't unrecognizably different. All three are arguing that lessons learned from the pandemic, that is a natural, quote, but actually anthropogenic disaster to deal with which politics has had to listen to the science and people have had to make big changes. Um, those lessons can helpfully be transferred to coping with the climate emergency. And by the same token, I think all are exposed to essentially the same kind of danger. What danger? Well, there is the obvious one of giving hostages to disillusion. When business as usual beckons again, the less appealing aspects of human nature may very well re-emerge forcefully to view. But I'm not really concerned about that aspect of it because it's generally no bad thing to accentuate the positive and Greens are in any case by now pretty well inured to the disillusion which often follows. Um, moreover, even if the response to the pandemic hasn't decisively signaled the end of the neoliberal project or fostered a consensus pursuit of the common wheel, it is undeniable that some 
really useful additions have been made to the armory of those fighting the climate emergency by this experience. Uh, John's idea of uh, adapting the epidemiological notion of flattening the curve of infection uh, to demonstrate what needs to be done with the emissions curve seems to be, for instance, a very useful propedeutic. And uh, I think equally Anne is right that the pandemic experience has made it a lot easier to uh, grasp how a combination of you know, excessive human intervention in the natural world and global hypermobility has put us all at risk. I'm not saying anything intended to downplay these real COVID related gains for climate campaigning, but what I take to be a serious danger of the approach which John and Anna are canvassing um, and which Caroline I think was simplifying is that in drawing encouraging analogies between the COVID response and the potential climate emergency response, they all risk obscuring the very significant disanalogy and thereby perhaps misleading us as to the kind of effort which remains needed. So the disanalogy is simple enough. COVID presents an immediate and pretty unignorable threat to anyone with a Twitter feed. You know, COVID can kill you or your loved ones in a couple of weeks. Its wider consequences endanger vital public services on which we all depend. And it follows that Almost anyone paying minimal attention is liable to be scared by these possibilities enough, as we've seen, to outweigh at least temporarily their aversion to quite drastic restrictions on taken for granted liberties. But here in the West, at any rate, to be scared enough about oncoming climate disaster to accept restrictions of a similar order, you need to have qualities which only a minority possess. At the moment, you need to be intelligent enough to absorb and process all the relevant information, imaginative enough to represent the down the line consequences vividly to yourself in the present, reflective enough to see what this implies for your life. And on top of that, you need to be honest and brave enough not to leap to uh, the many and various forms of denial or displacement activity which are available. And that combination of qualities is actually quite far from being displayed by anyone with a Twitter feed. Now, I mean, I find, um, I've found it difficult to get green audiences to accept this point, and, and you can see why. For instance, I take it that everyone interested enough and concerned enough about the issues to be attending this meeting belongs, as do I, to that minority. But of course, as well as being honest, brave, intelligent, imaginative and reflective, we're all quite naturally modest. Um, we don't, we're loath to think of ourselves as specially distinguished in these regards, um, specially qualified by our virtues to appreciate and act on the climate threats which now confront humanity. But that's what we are, and we overlook it or downplay it, not just at our peril, but at everybody else's, because it's only through continued vanguard action by this minority that we've got any chance of creating the possibility of turning this around. Now, of course, the boundaries of that constituency, the intelligent, the imaginative and reflective are not fixed. Um, and one would like to think of them as expanding all the time. But whatever you think about that, um, it's still the case that John's graphic of the flattened curve only illuminates our climate plight for people capable of grasping in full frightening recognition what the planet's failure to cope with, um, with all these emissions would actually entail. Um, we have to increase the numbers of those people as fast as possible. We also have to act in the meanwhile. And that will only happen, I think, or succeed anyway, through a combination of firstly, you know, campaigning in whatever form continually hammers home three or four basic slogans about what needs to be done. Um, secondly, interventions which in whatever form actively subvert the fossil fuel state and set up real on the ground alternatives. And finally, and increasingly, the impact of the climate disasters themselves, uh, such that eventually, you know, even the Daily Mail runs headlines saying that the Greens were right all along. Now, this is a daunting challenge. It's a very exacting agenda. But as it were, reassurances about human possibilities drawn from the COVID experience can't be banked against its demands. We have to create and recreate those possibilities ongoingly. I think that's what John was referring to in terms of coping 
rather than finding solutions. If at this critical juncture we draw from a false analogy, the democratically comforting thought that people at large are now readier to listen to us on these matters than actually they are, we may not speak in the next vital few years with a clear enough and harsh enough voice, nor act with the required revolutionary ruthlessness. So those are my few sceptical thoughts and I leave them with you. Thank you, John. You did a really great um, sort of extraction from both uh, John and Anne's um, ideas. And I, I love the way you've introduced and injected your own. Um, I'm going to hand over to Reinhardt now. And uh, please do keep going with the questions. We've got some really interesting ones boiling over here. So Reinhardt, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Prashan. And uh, good morning from Germany. I'm Reinhard Loske, um, as has been said by Prashan, Professor of Sustainability, but also a political animal. I spent uh, a lot of time in politics as MP, as uh, state uh, minister and in various other functions. But uh, my lifetime topic is uh, sustainability, um, nature, ecology, but also the link or the interface between society and nature, let's say. And um, I have neither a prepared speech nor a slides, but I just want to make some comments on the actual uh, debate. Uh, and first of all, the overall or the overarching question to me is, uh, is it possible to have change by design or is it only possible uh, to have change by a disaster, by a catastrophe, by a crisis? And if you look at uh, the pure, um, figures from the 90s on the CO2 curve, for example, there have been uh, until now two relevant climate policy um, measures. One was the collapse of the Soviet Union in, the, in 90, around 1990, uh, when uh, the emissions went down temporarily. And the second one was the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, when again, the emissions went down temporarily. And now, we have uh, another uh, deep crisis, which uh, brings a lot of human suffering, which is bad, uh, but at the same time, it will brown, bring down emissions uh, temporarily or permanently. That is the question now. And, and this is my entrance, my point of entrance in, in the debate. I think it's time now for uh, political measures by design. And before uh, coming to some concrete, uh, measures um, that are uh, discussed or even implemented in Europe. In the meantime, I would uh, like to make some general remarks, some lessons to be learned. They are very close to the other speakers by the two Johns and by Anne, so I can keep them uh, short. Uh, that, that are For me, that's 10 lessons. The first one is uh, the limits lesson, I would like to call it, uh, because both crises show that uh, ignoring uh, natural boundaries or planetary boundaries um, creates um, enormous uh, problems, not only in the, in the long run, but also in the short run. And the way we treat uh, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere in particular, the animals, be it wild animals or be it, uh, be it uh, farm animals, uh, that is uh, a topic that people can understand that and that our health and uh, the planet's health uh, are deeply interconnected. Uh, and that is uh, a point a lot of people understand. So the way we treat nature, um, that is one, my, my first one. The second point is uh, the science uh, question. So ignoring science uh, is dangerous. This is true for climate and biodiversity on the one side, but also for uh, the science on, on viruses. Uh, and those who ignore science, uh, mainly populists, as has been said by, by Anne, but also uh, lobbyists, they are bad for preventive policies. And in so far, criticizing lobbyism and criticizing populism is, uh, should be at the top of the agenda for green politics. And um, when, when uh, saying that taking uh, science seriously, that does not mean to replace democracy through the rule of people by expertocracy, by the rule of uh, scientists and experts. It's just about 
taking science seriously. That is very, uh, very important. Not uh, a scientific uh, uh, worldview, but taking it seriously. That's my second lesson. The third one is the political lesson. So in, in, at least in democratic societies, very often it is said, if you go too far, in let's say environmental policies, climate protection or so, and then people will don't like it and they will not reelect you and then you are get, then you are um, out of office. They kick you out of office. For example, last year when the German government, Chancellor Merkel presented her climate policy program, which was extremely modest. She said, you know, uh, this is all what is possible under given circumstances. So, and, and this, uh, this um, excuse, if you go too far, if you are too ambitious, uh, then people will not support you any longer. This is not true because now in the, in the COVID-19 crisis, we had very far reaching measures and the people accepted it. Of course, in the short term, it's more dangerous. However, um, I would say if you, that is a, a very important political le lesson. If you uh, base your uh, policy on, on uh, on grounded uh, facts and uh, and you communicate them properly, then the acceptance is much higher than uh, politicians uh, say quite often. So the argument is uh, adequate policies to protect future interests is possible uh, if people can understand and uh, people can uh, see uh, the facts and the arguments. The fourth lesson is the intergenerational uh, lesson, I would like to call it. I mean, if you uh, talk about climate or environmental uh, aspects, the main message of the young generation to the old generation is, uh, well, don't forget our interests. Uh, keep our interests uh, in mind. Don't uh, eat up the future. And now in the corona uh, crisis, it was exactly the other way around. The message uh, by, by the older generation to the younger generation was, well, uh, be cautious uh, because we are very vulnerable, stay at home, be careful, keep distance and so on and so forth. And I would say more or less the younger generation uh, did it. So they took uh, responsibility. And if we don't want um, um, a war of generations, but an intergenerational solidarity as we have had it during the crisis or still have it more or less, of course there are exceptions, then it means we need a new uh, social contract, a new intergenerational um, contract in society. And uh, that means that the older generations that are, their thinking is quite often centered around aspects of uh, all kinds of security. They should take the future issues more seriously. Uh, and uh, so that is another recommendation I would like to give to green parties or green movements in general. Uh, take this intergenerational aspect uh, uh, into your uh, into your form of, of argument, because now, for example, if you look at the enormous stimulus packages and recovery programs, what you see is there will be an enormous debt burden. Future generations will have to carry it, and the minimum we can do or we have to do now is that those packages and programs should take uh, sustainability aspects very, very seriously, be it green energy, sustainable transport, agriculture, education, and so on and so forth. That's uh, another important lesson to me. And uh, the next one, number five, is the economic lesson, I would like to call it. And it, it is so obvious now that we went too far in the global division of labor, and that created a lot of uh, vul vulnerability in our product chains. Uh, and this uh, extreme orientation towards efficiency, competition, markets, selfishness, and so on and so forth, that uh, will come uh, to an end. Uh, that is my, my expectation. And so the agenda of uh, selective uh, deglobalization, uh, re-regionalization, uh, so circular economy aspects, and also deceleration, um, or some people call it the sufficiency agenda, uh, that should be at the top uh, priority or the list of top priorities. Um, the number six is uh, what I call the infrastructure lesson. Keep uh, uh, public infrastructures under public control, uh, be it uh, health, uh, education, energy, water, transportation, and so on. So public, the, the agenda of public goods, 
uh, that have to follow other uh, another rationale, not only efficiency and competitiveness, but uh, it should serve for the common good. That is uh, another very uh, important uh, and I would even say promising agenda for green movements. Uh, number uh, seven uh, would be um, the lessons for, for the whole agenda on, on work. So the balance between uh, care work and uh, gainful employment, let's say, uh, and because the importance of care work has been so obvious during this crisis that uh, it needs to be in the center of our argument, be it uh, on the reduction of, uh, of working hours or be it on the basic income um, side. So there is a, a clear connection between the sustainability agenda and the agenda of uh, how to democratize work and um, reduce working hours to uh, reduce uh, enormous growth pressure uh, on the on the labor uh, sector um, the final point i would like to make is uh, the globalization lesson i would like to call it um, what we have learned during the crisis that uh, the uh, the crisis was not a good time for global governance let's let's keep it that general uh, the idea of global governance uh, um, uh, was hurt during, during this crisis, definitely. And on the contrary, we had a sort of uh, uh, renaissance of, of the nation state and uh, sub-national levels, which is understandable from a protective perspective, but at the same time, in the long term, if we have so many global problems, we should try to find uh, uh, ways to combine the aspects of global cooperation and global solidarity with the needs of sustainability that include the deglobalization and regionalization. And in so far, uh, I would say we need a new agenda. Uh, I would like to call it uh, the globalization agenda. It's an artificial word, a combination of global and local or, or regional. This globalization agenda means that we need to be open-minded to the world uh, and its needs and global fairness issues, but at the same time that uh, strategies of decentralization are part of the answer to the global challenges and do not leave this to the populists and to, to the nationalists because that is a real danger a real real danger so that we need uh, to talk about another form of uh, um, globalization which i would like to call globalization so my my final minute uh, is on on the practical things because we have in the meantime some experience uh, in the european union and in in germany for example uh, the German government has passed its uh, stimulus package on Wednesday and the community, the, the European Union has also its, its uh, recovery program and it, it is uh, inconsistent, it's, it's, but it's a mixed picture, I would say. It's a really a mixed picture. Uh, the, there are three messages in the various stimulus packages. The, one is the, the first one is back to consumerism as soon as possible. So this is why they reduce value added tax, why they reduce energy prices and, and other things. Uh, the second message is back to growth, um, strengthening business. And the third message, which is uh, uh, called the future investments, uh, that is uh, there's a, this, this green package. There are a lot of uh, things in it, be it renewables, uh, e-mobility, hydrogen and so. It's very technocratic, I would say, however, my final point would, would be that society has changed, preferences of society have changed, and you can find it in the recovery programs. So there is a certain share of, of future investments, uh, but it, is, uh, it, is, it runs contrary to the first two messages, back to consumerism, back to growth. And this tension uh, is there and needs to be treated from a political perspective. Thank you. Prashant. Thank you very much, Reinhard. That was a fantastic uh, tour de force, I think, of all the main issues. Um, what I'm proposing to do now, actually, is because we, we've had a whole stem of uh, questions coming in, which are all very interesting. So what I'm proposing is that I'll, I'll take a couple of these questions and address them to particular speakers. And then um, hopefully that will take us to about um, um, the, the half hour. And then I think maybe we can break up into six groups. And within those groups, I'm going to target one particular question. And this question is really, what can um, th these little discussion groups uh, bring back to the, the, the plenary about what, one single thing that uh, you can learn from COVID that could be applied to the
climate crisis. And then we'll reconvene maybe after 10, 15 minutes. And then I'll try to aim to finish it by uh, 12 you know, uh, on the dot. So the two questions I want to just tackle just now, one is to Reinhardt. Um, question really is what can we learn from other countries? And I'm, I'm assuming this is Germany in particular, because I think uh, some of the things that uh, Mark Merkel has been doing has been well respected here. What, what can Britain learn from other countries to make the necessary political changes in the UK? Uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's a mixed picture. So three messages. First one, back to consumerism. Second one, back to growth. And those are, of course, uh, uh, critical points, I would say, um, you know, because it's, it's, uh, the, the philosophy is uh, back to pre-corona times as soon as possible, back to normal, normality. And, uh, but at the same time, you have this uh, third uh, package called the future package. And if you look in the details, you have uh, 50 billion out of 120 billion are in this future package. And that is public money for renewables, for e-mobility, for green infrastructures, for hydrogen in the steel industry, and a little bit for agriculture and forestry, uh, adaptation measures uh, mainly. Uh, so um, what I said, it's, it's inconsistent, but again, if you compare it to the stimulus packages in 2008, 2009, that was uh, that is much greener today, I would say, because then it was only, you know, you get money if you buy a new car or absolutely stupid uh, road construction program. So this traditional form of uh, stimulating economic growth, that is uh, a bit different today. So th that would be my answer. I don't know if you can learn from Germany, but the, the green share in the stimulus packages uh, should be as high as possible. It should it should not be too inconsistent com comparing uh, the growth and the uh, and the consumerism issue okay thank you very much so, so far <laughs> we had a question for john uh, foster as well um if the threat of COVID is so inherently scary to the public why are we so keen to just go back to business as usual and you know what is it that's uh, that's kind of holding us back from realizing what we realize uh well that's an interesting question i mean i um i think we need to wait and see what happens when the R factor climbs above one again. Um, obviously, there are lots of concerns and determinants here. I mean, not least prominent examples of uh, folks not taking it seriously. Um, but I don't think that that's actually a counter argument to the, to the position I was putting, because I think, um, you know, People have been scared and to the extent that they think there is still a real you know threat of catching it and dying um, around they will continue to be scared uh, and they are not by and large in a widespread way that scared about climate change I mean you know, people sometimes come back at me on, on and say, well, what about the fact that, you know, surveys show that 80% of people are worried. Um, I tend to think that's an artifact of the sort of survey situation, you know, ask people, are you concerned about immorality? And they will say, oh, yes. Um, but that's different from agreeing to do something about stopping it. Um, and ditto with climate change. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to propose now is that we split up into groups. Um, now, I've never used this function in Zoom, so let's, I hope I can get it to work. Uh, what I'm asking is that people within their breakout rooms just get to know each other a little bit. Uh, we'll, I'll, we'll keep it going for about 10, 15, let's say until quarter to 12. And um, just, uh, just respond to the question, um, what is it uh, you think would be the most important things to learn from COVID to help us with the climate crisis. And then I'll, I'll close up the break, breakout rooms at quarter to 12 and if you, one of you can uh, just elect a spokesperson and come back with the answers. And there's so many more interesting questions here. So what I'm going to do with the questions is I'll pull them all off and I'll send it to the speakers and if people care to answer them, uh, they can, uh, they can, uh, I can, we can email them back to the group. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to do justice to all the questions just now. So let me just try doing the breakout rooms. Uh, let's make six different groups. So it'd be roughly five to six participants per room. Uh, these won't be recorded, so uh, you'll have to yourselves just uh, come up with uh, whatever you, you decide. And uh, somebody from your group then, would you 
what, what kind of thing do you think you can uh, take out yeah, message? We talked about um, uh, well, firstly, the importance of local green spaces, uh, and you know, I think because that's what people have really valued in this lockdown thing, and somewhere where you can walk or cycle, and it's really important having somewhere local for that. And and then we talked about the need for uh, people want information, not spin. And, and that's really critical and that's sometimes uh, lacking uh, good, in, good, reliable, trustworthy information with respect to climate change and stuff. And, uh, and we need progressive internationalist organisations to ensure that that information can get to everybody in the world and perhaps new social um, media channels to enable that to happen. Um, but then as a you know, we're also aware of, you know, politics is about ideas and power and the existing power structures uh, trying to put us back to normal. And, uh, you know, that's the danger, really. That's a summary of what we had. So group number two was uh, Dorothy Wilson, Reinhardt, Stephen and William. Any, any spokesperson yeah. from there? We haven't uh, selected a rapporteur, so I, I'll take the, <laughs> the job. Uh, and uh, after having some technical problems at the very beginning, <laughs> we started to discuss a rather general. Uh, and uh, one, one point we discussed was on the role of the younger generation, because I, I, I mentioned the point in my presentation concerning intergenerational solidarity and the, the signals from the Corona debate, were, uh, were, you know, the young uh, guys and girls uh, looking after the older people and uh, the main message in the climate or sustainability debate is that older generations should take into uh, into consideration the future the interests of future generations and how this uh, this plays uh, in, in the in reality and uh, william was giving some comments on the on the uh, on the school strikes and saying that uh, they are mainly an urban phenomenon, if I understood you uh, rightly, and but but uh, the topic is still there. It's, it's not completely overshadowed by the COVID-19 debate, um, but but maybe this this uh, intergenerational thing is uh, because it, it, it's at the heart of the sustainability agenda, the the generational justice, yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, not only the international solidarity, but also the intergenerational solidarity. Uh, we, we didn't really come to a conclusion before that uh, the, the time frame was too tight and narrow. Let me try and answer you correctly. Are you saying that um, the climate, the intergenerational issue is between generations that are currently in existence. So older people tend to go on longer holidays, have more disposable income, younger people are going to face climate change, or is it the unborn generations and the currently born generations? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the school strikes at the Fridays for Future movement or so that in, in Germany, millions of uh, uh, young girls and boys took uh, part uh, in the demonstrations and they had an enormous political impact and they, were changing the agenda, I would say, until COVID-19 came. However, the uh, political decisions made in Germany, for example, in the climate program in autumn 2019 were very weak. As I said, the chancellor said, well, you know, this is, this is all what is possible under given circumstances. And now in the COVID-19, uh, post-COVID-19, it's not really post, but in the, the, the now starting with the recovery program, uh, suddenly things are possible that weren't possible half a year ago. That, that is uh, interesting. And uh, as I said, the, the young generation practiced uh, solidarity with the older generations. And now it's time for older generations to also practice solidarity concerning future interests. And this new intergenerational contract that could be a, a political topic that is uh, promising for the movement, for the Green Movement. Thank you. Breakout room number three was John Barry, Francis, Michel, and Suze. Sue, do you want to give feedback? You're at mute, Sue. Ooh, Sue, you're, mute. You're, you're mute. Michel, do you want to speak? Has anybody started? Sue, go ahead. 
Okay, I tried to keep our group to choosing one thing because that's what we were asked to do. And we came up with the state and it works, it's worked to a pretty good extent for keeping us tamed for COVID. And it would be good if it could uh, uh, take on the responsibility of dealing with uh, green issues. But we also talk quite a lot about um, uh, global issues as opposed to European or UK issues and how we see a lot about COVID and its effects and we have done during the period but we don't see nearly so much about global warming and its effects globally and it would be good to see more of that locally. Does that make sense? Sort of, but can I make sure I understood you correctly? So you're saying that for COVID, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of the conversations have been about how um, you know, countries in the West, America, how they've been impacted. Uh, yes. We see less about, we see a little bit about Brazil, but I don't remember seeing very much about India. You know, I tend to work quite closely with my Indian colleagues and um, very bad there. Is that what you're talking about? Or is uh, it... Um, that quite cover the point. I'm trying to say that because we've seen a lot about the effects of COVID, We've done what the government has said, and the government's uh, done some sensible things in trying to stop COVID spreading. Um, but because we don't see so much about global warming and its effects currently um, in Africa, I know we all saw the Australian blaze, but people are, are losing their livings uh, in, and, and their places to live with sea levels rising. And, and food not growing because of climate change. But we don't see that in our country. And we don't see it on television. We don't see uh, information about it. We don't get told about the terrible drastic effects of it. Not nearly as much as we get told whoops, about the drastic effects of COVID. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, the next breakout group was number four, which was John Foster, John Bynorth, Lucy, Ray, and Rebecca. Any spokesperson there? Yeah, um, that was me. Um, well, <laughs> the, the key take on message, as it were, from COVID um, was that we need to find ways to ensure that governments are prepared to act as drastically and with as much political courage um, in relation to the climate emergency as the COVID experience has shown that under pressure they can do. Um, that certainly means clear messaging. Um, you put it much better than me. But it also means, um, or we thought it, it, we should think about it possibly meaning, identifying a single key master measure in something of the way that there has been such a single key master measure in relation to COVID. So the emergency, if you like, the main driver of the emergency response in COVID was, you know, more or less everyone has to stay at home. And then uh, corollary measures to support that, you know, income support, uh, support for businesses, enforcement, um, building up the NHS, those followed. Um, so something similar for the climate emergency might be, well, it might be everyone has to stay within a carbon ration and then, you know, a citizen's income to ensure that nobody starves as a result. Similar consequent measures. That's the kind of thing we were envisaging would be meant by drastic action. Um, and we've learned perhaps from the COVID business that when people do actually recognize that they are now already in an emergency, that's the kind of thing that can be done. But of course, that last qualifying clause is the crunch. So that was, that was where we got to. May, I ask, may I ask a question to, to John? Please uh, do. Yeah. Uh, John, you, you said in your presentation, um, that it's uh, if you want to sh show the right reaction to the COVID-19 challenge and the climate challenge, you need to be um, imaginative, reflective, conscious, or in, in, in one word, uh, somehow intellectual or so. But I doubt if this is uh, 
if, uh, if, if this is true, because if you look at the present uh, discussion, so many so-called ordinary people understand where the problems are about, that we didn't accept uh, limits uh, that nature gives to us, or that we didn't see the importance of care work for society, or that we didn't see the, the value of those who keep society running. Uh, so the, 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 the judgment does not necessarily be intellectual or reflective in a, in a broader sense, but it's, it's also intuition, isn't it? That, that is my question to John. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair point. I don't actually like the phrase ordinary people because it's... Um, oh, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't, yeah, but I mean, I think people who are, um, who have those intuitions and act on them or are mm. to act on them and are prepared, you know, to turn their lives upside down as a result, aren't ordinary. Um, mm but there aren't enough of them um, mm -hmm. that point stands and um, you know we need to find ways of ensuring that there are more of them and certainly there aren't as many of them in relation to climate as there are people prepared to be shit scared about the covid crisis um, that was that was my sort of single the message from my own presentation mm -hmm. uh, though not necessarily from from our discussion group Okay, breakout group uh, five, which was Chris, Rachel, and Tanya, beguiling me, she or her. Yes, um, yeah, um, I'll um, speak for the group there. Um, we identified um, several kind of um, movements, forces in, in uh, opposite directions. Um, we, we saw a, a certain um, retreat into domestic spaces and into familiarity um, and um, in terms of things like being able to um, work from home, uh, decreases in stress from that. Um, but we also um, acknowledged and heard about um, people losing their jobs and having their cosy places, if you like, busted open and um, increases in stress from that, so the, there were those two uh, working at the same time. Uh, we also identified um, from our government in particular, um, apathy, uh, lack of imagination, um, lack of consultation, kind of um, all size fits all sort of policies. Um, and at the same time, at community grassroots levels, um, very detailed um, community work and at the same time as uh, both of those um, global um, grassroots movements, um, such as um, Black Lives Matter happening at the same time. So um, within all of those, um, I think the key thing we identified was um, the fact that change is possible, but the urgent need to, um, as we said, um, what's the word, um, the capture, um, that that change um, so that it can continue and to do so in a way that um, acknowledges the need for a resilience, for a particularly um, psychological resilience and um, the need for real consultation. Thank you very much. Um, and the last one is room six, which was Andy, Brian, Rick and Steve Gray. I think this is quite a small group, actually. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, briefly say where we, where we were at. <laughs> it was more of me, more of me <laughs> talking to the others. Uh, I was telling them I'm recently, I'm one year in, I'm elected, recently elected Green Party Councillor in Belfast. And just picking up on what John was saying and how, or what or John Barry was saying, or once what was deemed impossible is now seemed possible. But how do you move that conversation on? How do you bring those? Groups that are fiscally that are there, those parties and those groups that are fiscally conservative. How, how can you shift them on in that in that conversation? How can you sell this to them? Because it's COVID is very it's here and now. It's almost like the planetary emergency is almost like a long slow death, and I don't think a lot of people realise. And a lot of people want to go back to the norm, and is want to go back to normal. Isn't is it because that that's the only sort of norm we've ever known? So how do we bring, so I was, I was asking the question, how do we bring others forward in that? And it seems to be a more sort of intergenerational thing that I think most young people are more open to the ideas. It's, it's how do we bring those 
those in their, their, their 40s, 50s onwards, how do, we, how do we bring them into the conversation? How do we sell this and how do we shift people on? Thank you, Brian. Um, I think that we're about 12 o'clock now, so I wanted to quite try to close at this time, but it's been a fantastically fruitful discussion. And um, I can see from the kind of clatter on the, the chat uh, box that there's an awful lot of people wanting to stay in touch and uh, do a WhatsApp group. Um, I'm, I didn't notice anybody volunteering to set that up, but if anybody wishes to, um, please please do go ahead. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna try to summarize everything we just heard there, because there's just so much a fruitful um, sort of discussion. But I mean, the, the one sort of take home message I had was probably agreeing a lot with what Brian just said, that um, I think, I can't remember who wrote the book, but it was the book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, of the kind of difference between um, our ability to, to react to things that are immediately in the then and there, those kind of threats, and uh, our incapacity to then translate those into the longer term stuff. And that's my slight worry about uh, the kind of trying to juxtapose COVID with climate change. I mean, COVID is too much an immediate threat, protect the NHS, protect, you know, stay indoors, very simple messaging. Um, it's quite different to the kind of messaging that I've seen in the um, the, the uh, chat box about carbon rationing and some of the much more sophisticated um, long-term and lifestyle changing um, suggestions that we need to, to address with climate change. So I think the, the, uh, what we can learn is, I'm not sure exactly how, how, how much it is, but it was uh, this idea of you know, society changing, we, we need to do it. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some things we can learn from COVID, but I think we've just got to be open to the possibility. I think, as John Foster said, that there's only so much we can. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, uh, stop here. What um, I think we, I'll do is um, the list of questions that, uh, in the chat box, I'll distribute it amongst the speakers. If they care to, uh, we can, uh, they can uh, respond to some of these questions. And thanks, everybody. And thanks especially for the speakers and the papers that they wrote, because I must say, I read those papers and they were, they were all great. A lot of thought had gone into them, and uh, I mean, I've been participating in a lot of conversations about COVID over the last few weeks, and uh, some of the stuff here is really genuinely quite new. Okay, thanks everybody, and have a nice rest of the weekend. Thank you for chance. Thank you. Bye. -bye.